Uh, so this is going to be a little bit uh, unique. We're calling this a fireside chat. Uh, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a little bit of selfishness in here because with a fireside chat, Jeff, what don't we have to do? We don't have to prepare any slides. <laughs> That's right. So we get to share our infinite wisdom about, about this stuff without actually having to make it pretty in slides. Well, that, that's part of it. We are going to share some slides here and there uh, that I think both Jeff and I have taken from other places that support the dialogue. But this is going to be a lot more podcasty. And, and so with that, we might even use this in a podcast I do with my friend, uh, um, a Tom, my very good friend. What's his name, though? Tom Morris. <laughs> Tom is the executive director of Metal Treating Institute, and Tom and I do this podcast called Association Strong. And if you're interested in that, if you like podcasts and you like talking about member engagement and, and learning about what your peers are doing out there in the world uh, of associations, then check out associationstrong.com. And, um, uh, and you know, what? we might, depending on how this, this plays out, we might take this and make it an episode of Association Strong with our guest host, That'd Jeff. Be awesome. That'd be awesome. Let's do it. So with that, Jeff, uh, why, don't we, uh, why don't we do some brief introductions? Uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows who we are. Uh, I'll start. I'm Dave Will. I'm the co-founder of a company called PropFuel. Uh, I'll tell you about PropFuel in just a second, but I live in the Boston area. I, it's a gorgeous day here in Boston, hence my Kona brand shirt here and uh, is my little Hawaiian flannel. And uh, I'm in the Boston area. I've been working with associations on the software side for the past 20 some odd years. I had another company prior to PropFuel called Peach New Media. And, um, uh, and now that's owned by Community Brands. And I started uh, PropFuel with my compadre, uh, Cameron Aubuchon. Now, what I'd like to do, though, is uh, tell you a little bit about PropFuel. And here's one slide. I'm a big fan of visuals when it comes to explaining something. So this is what I'd like to show you. PropFuel is a software company. And what we do is we help associations, very specifically associations. We have 200 uh, associations that we're working with. 200 of our associations are engaging the members a little bit better through email and SMS by centering certain types of emails and SMS around questions. The idea is to capture insight so that we can help you personalize your engagement with them. And it all happens in a highly scalable, automated way. And here's some examples. In fact, this Are You Ghosting Us was one of the award-winning um, uh, marketing campaigns that went out recently. So that's, that's a little bit about PropFuel and me. Jeff, who are you? Awesome, Dave. Thanks. Who am I? So, well, for starters, I'm coming to you live from Ottawa, Canada. So just outside of the nation's capital here in Ottawa, I did see some, I think I saw at least one person maybe say Ottawa, you know, so we've got some people. I am literally drinking a Tim Hortons coffee right now just to be super Canadian, you know, because there's nothing more Canadian than, it's not even that good, but it's just, you know, Canadiana to be having a nice Timmy's. Um, so what do I do? I, similar to Dave, I've been in the association space from a technology standpoint for a couple of decades. So uh, I've been doing this for a long time, a background in web and web experiences for a associations. And uh, now I'm the co-founder and CEO at a company called Wicket. We're the world's first uh, member data platform and really transforming how associations um, think about member data. Just because Dave did, I'm going to show you a quick visual of Wicket as well, just so I can keep up and be cool. Um, but really, a member data platform, really, it's it's often thought of as an alternative to association management software, working with really forward-thinking associations like ASAE to kind of bring a different uh, technology stack to them and a different way of thinking about storing your membership data, connecting it within an ecosystem of, of software tools. So just bringing a different approach um, to the sector and uh, what we like to think is a much more modern one that really represents uh, the future for the sector. So that's that's me and that's Wicked and love Dave and love his team. At uh -huh. And I, I get to see this guy in person on Saturday this in, weekend, in, in Atlanta. You know, he's not supposed to timestamp podcasts, but this weekend ASAE begins. I hope to see you guys there. Hey, let us know in the chat if you're going to ASAE um, in Atlanta, that is. Uh, so flip the script, move from talking at members to communicating with members at scale. There's a lot in that title. I take that title, Jeff, and I bring it down to a really simple concept, which is how do we take our very data 
oriented thought process when we're well in theory as it should be thinking about membership how do we take that and make it a more human experience how do we extract information out of that to create a more human exchange and that's really a big part of what we're talking about today do you want to talk through the agenda for our discussion yeah, yeah for sure yeah it's really what we're what it's all about today is talking about how we can turn data into that experience um, and a more personalized experience for members and We'll give our, our different perspectives on that. Really hoping everybody kind of engages in the chat, ask questions. You know, if we say something controversial, let us know what you think about it. You know, for sure, we want to keep this as a conversation. Um, it's the advantage of this not being a podcast, Dave. When was yeah. the last time a Canadian said something controversial? I don't know. I, once every six months or so, I say something controversial. But no, I'm pretty controversial in the association technology space. Um, let's face it. Um, but today, what are what are we're going to talk through a few different topics? David, I is going to kind of guide the conversation, show some visuals here and there. We're going to talk about kind of the problem that associations are facing with how they're communicating with members and driving that member experience. Talk about data and the role of data and the importance of trust and confidence in your data in order you know, to flip that script, um, how to turn it, turn the data into personalized action and create a better connection with your members. And then we'll talk through some specific examples to make it all feel a little bit more real. Dave's going to show a few things. I'm going to show something, um, try to, you know, just make, connect the dots and uh, maybe share some key takeaways at the end. And we'll encourage you all uh, to do, to do the same. So, so let's, let's start with this, Jeff. Let's start with what I think we, and, and by the way, this is not completely off the cuff, obviously. Jeff and I got together um, and and talked through what, what are the issues uh, surrounding making data a more human experience and, and how do we go about this? How, what's the best way for us to communicate the things that we want to help with? And, and uh, by the way, we are going to end this with a little giveaway. Um, not everybody's going to get something, but I think some of you will. And uh, so, so uh, stay tuned for that at the very end. Uh, but we want to start with identifying what the problem is. What what is it we're here to talk about? What is it we're trying to solve? And and Jeff, what I'll do is I'll I'll position it as I think the problem exists, and then I'd love for you to um, challenge that or add to it in any way you'd like. But I, I think uh, for the most part, and there's a little might be a little assertive, aggressive to say this, but I think associations communicate ineffectively generally. And, and, and you know what, it's not only associations. We've been trained over the years through the technology at our fingertips to communicate ineffectively. I mean, let's, let's go back in time. We had letters, right? And so people would write letters and there's a lot of good things to be said about writing letters, but we can all think of some things that are not so good about writing letters too. Um, then it goes to what fax. I'm probably skipping some communications, but uh, or, or some old guy shows up at your door with a, a little message and and Morse code or some I don't know. What are those called again? <clears throat> Wire. Anyway. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah but we're not doing much of that anymore. Um, on purpose, maybe a joke here and there. But it, then we went to fax. You know, and, and I know some companies that actually built a business around faxing messages. It, uh, I mean, that's fascinating to me. And then we go to email. Email shows up in the 90s, right? And that's when we start to embrace email. And we're like, wow, this is pretty cool because we can send a whole bunch of people messages. And then email marketing comes up where you have certain triggers to say, okay, well, when this happens, these people get this message. And when this happens, they no longer get that message. And there's there's drip campaigns. So email marketing is pretty cool. But all of that is centered around the assumption that what you have to say is really the only important thing. <laughs> what you have to say is more important than what lies on the receiving end of that. It's a broadcast. That's the problem. And that's what makes uh, a lot of our communications, ours included, meaning when, when we try to communicate, we, we're trained to tell people things. And so that's the hiccup. That's the problem in our telegrams. Thank you. Yeah, you got it, Jeff. Uh, so, oh, Nancy. Nancy got that. Thanks, Nancy. But the idea behind this broadcast messaging, even when we try to personalize it a little bit, 
it, uh, we, we, how do we try to personalize it? We, we break people into groups and segments, right? Like that's, that's the best we've been able to do with the technology that we have. And, and you know what, I have a cool visual I'm gonna share around this as well. Um, I've shared this many a time at conferences. In fact, if you stop by our booth, you'll probably see me holding one of these things. So, so think about how we try to personalize things. We put people in the segments and in your AMS or in Wicket for that matter, you have all this data about people and you say, okay, let's take this group of people. That's male and born in 1948, raised in the UK, married twice, lives in a castle, wealthy and famous. Like generally speaking, you could make the argument that this person, if you have a group of people that fit this category, most of these things, that they're gonna be very, very similar in their wants and their needs and their desires and until you realize that they are not at all alike, right? I love I love this visual. And, and if you've been around uh, me or, or at a booth at a, at a trade show, this is something we use to spark a conversation. Uh, so, so that's that's really, I think, the problem is that we don't have a way of making our messaging relevant to individuals. It, it, now, of course, there are certain things we can do around personalization, but we are going to, over the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to show you some ways that you can collect information effectively and then utilize it to create a highly engaging, effective, and relevant message for your members. So if that sounds good. I hope you're paying attention. Yeah, no, Dave, I'll just, I'll just um, add to that a little bit too. Like, I think, you know, there's definitely like email marketing is kind of where a lot of communication to members happens. And, and that's kind of where a lot of associations have landed, which is broadcast email marketing messages, pushing them out um, and probably inundating members with, with those messages. There's a lot, there's a lot of other ways that we do the same thing on other platforms too. Like if you think about your website, Right, or your member portal, once a member's logged in, like you're also broadcasting a message there. You're trying to kind of capture the broadest possible audience and you know, make some statements or maybe say what you think you should be promoting at any given time or your online community, how you're presenting or promoting things. So you can almost think of it across all these different platforms you use. It's kind of similar, you're broadcasting, you know, and you tend, most organizations tend to not really uh, personalize it. It's at that very broadcast level. So really, I think what so much of that boils down to is member experience, right? How can you give the best possible experience to your member, make your member feel like you know them and you're delivering really targeted value uh, to them? And I think the good news is, is that there's ways to get there. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit today is like, what are the, what's the foundation? And then, you know, how can you use software and tools and, and build off that foundation uh, to get there? So. Hey, hey, Jeff, I, uh... By the way, ask questions as we go. I, I'd much prefer not save time for a Q&A at the end and yeah. just manage Q&A throughout the process. And uh, Alexander says, what What are your thoughts about value graphics? Well, I'm doing a quick little education on what value graphics are because I've never heard of that before. I, Based on what I'm seeing, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alexander, but based on what I'm seeing, I'm assuming it's a sophisticated way of uh, vi visualizing member or, or uh, groups of people's and their needs. Um, and if that's the case, I would say the same is true with surveys in general, which would be it's an aggregate perspective of your membership. So you're collecting groups of data and then maybe you can segment that, just segment it better perhaps what I'm going to propose and everything that PropFuel stands for at least, and I think Wicket supports uh, with the foundational data, everything we talk about, that's a strong statement. A lot of the stuff we talk about is centered around connecting with the individual, not around groups of people. It starts with a group. So here's here's an interesting thing. I think when when people think about um sending out a message it went from sending it to everybody to sending it from segments and that's kind of where we stop sounds like value graphics has has a better way of creating a segment um what we're doing is we're taking segments and we're bringing it down to the individual to the individual level kind of like you did back in the day when you read these choose your own adventure books and you can see on the back of this book there's this little 
uh, <laughs> where based on your, awesome. based on your decision, it creates this user experience, member experience. And so that's the difference here. What I want to talk about today is creating an individualized, personalized experience, not a way to send groups of people things that we think they might like. All right, cool, Jeff. And thanks. I think, and doing it at scale. I think that's the key. Is like, how do you do it at a large scale? Because it, it, that feels like a lot of work. <laughs> to, to connect yeah, it sure does, right? At an yeah. individual level. So, okay, cool. So, Dave, you want to transition to into talking a bit about data and and the role of data? Yeah, take us into the trust and and confidence. Our next topic. Yeah, cool. So we're going to talk a bit about just the importance of the foundational layer of your data in order to get to this idea of delivering more personalized experiences to your members. And so really this is about, you know, at its core, what is your source of truth for data in your organization and how much trust do you have in that data? So most associations are going to use one of a handful of types of systems for their source of truth. Like for the past couple of decades, the association management software system has been the standard. This is what most associations use. Others might use a CRM, you know, customer relationship management that maybe has been extended to be an AMS or just using a native tool like a Salesforce or something else. So those have been super common. And then uh, the concept of the member data platform and the work we do here at Wicked is a is a is kind of the the newest evolution of that and thinking a little bit differently. So the key is to at least be able to know and identify, um, you know, what your system of record is. I think one of the challenges most associations have seen over the past many, many years and many experiences is that, you know, the AMS approach isn't perfect. It's got cracks in it, right? Like AMS systems are big and they try to do a lot in one system. Um, and the result usually is that they don't do a ton of those things super well. And so it ends up with staff being frustrated and often it ends up by the time the experience gets out to the actual member, it's not really an ideal experience at all, right? Because it's kind of thinking from the inside of the organization out. So, so I think that, you know, and, and, you know, me and people like Dave, we have conversations with associations every day, and it's very, very common for someone to say, I hate my AMS. You know, it's just, you, you hear it so very much. Um, and so- All the time, Jeff, all the time. I can't think of many- uh, many conversations where people talk about their AMS and they love it. The best I've heard is, yeah, it's fine. Okay. Like they don't complain about it. That's the best I heard. Yeah, being Canadian. Can you describe your marriage like that? We have a little sign <laughs> put up at our booth at conferences that says, because uh, we're Canadian, we say, we're sorry you hate your AMS. Or we're sorry your AMS sucks. So anyway, um, but there's, you know, so it's just, it's a common problem and it's a challenge. And I think, you know, Part of the challenges with AMS solutions as well is often you do still end up with siloed data across your organization because you start using a lot of other software. Like a typical organization uses a lot of software, and I'll show you a visual of what that could look like um, in a second. But when data becomes disconnected, your uh, trust in your data just goes down. So whenever we talk about data silos, from our perspective here at Wicked, it's it's, it's inefficient, of course, because now you got to move data around manually and do all these things. But the biggest issue is eroding trust. When you look at the data, can you really trust that it's accurate? So really, the foundation of being able to connect at a more personal level with your members is really having a lot of confidence um, and trust in your data. So I'm going to show you just a quick visual of what an ecosystem of software can look like um, at, at an association. So I'm just gonna pull something up here quick. So this is an example, this is an organization we're working with uh, here at Wicket. You can see the Profio logo in there, Dave's working with them too. So this is a, an organization who, as you can see, they use, I don't know, five, eight, 12, 16, it's almost 20 different software tools here are within their ecosystem and they use these tools for a whole bunch of different particular functions. Now, not every organization is using this many tools. Like it kind of goes with the size and scale of your organization and how much work you're doing, but across learning and community and web and all your different types of events and all the marketing you do and all these pieces, right? There's so many things um, that are out there that can be done. And, 
and and historically associations have struggled to really unite this data and really have a persistent what we call a persistent member record across all those systems so in a case like this that's where we bring the member data platform in to help connect help connect all those systems and have this unified source so we can then go back to sharing that data uh, with those other systems so as you can see it, it can be big right like most associations have a pretty big ecosystem of software tools uh, that they're going to be using across the organization and so really what becomes uh, important here is a few different things integrations and making sure your data is well integrated and having really good data hygiene for what we'd refer to as zero your zero party data right and and zero party data really is um you know that core data that you're collecting directly from your members who they are whether or not they're a member what their interests are all those things all the things you ask directly and they give to you um that's your zero party data so it's really important you know that you collect this data and then alongside it you're going to get what we'd call first party data as well, which is more behavioral data. It's like as your members going on a journey, um, they're conducting, they're taking certain actions and that's behavioral and you want to be tracking that sort of data as well. So what's really important here is just this core, like having a lot of confidence in your data and knowing that you have a system of record that you can really rely on to say, okay, this data is strong. This is up to date. And as an organization, we have confidence in them. Yeah, but I, I, I love that. I'm going to get even more specific, though, about a spe specific kind of data that I, I believe we lose trust in very quickly. And oh my gosh, there's, there are an in, incredible number of data issues from bad email addresses to people leaving jobs and moving on. What about students where you have their student email address and as soon as they graduate, you're gone, they're done. And by the way, do you know when they graduate? So there's there's all this data that is expired in no time at all. And that oftentimes that falls under what we might call profile data, right? So I suspect most of you um, are, have like 95% of your members have filled out all their profile data. Is that accurate? <laughs> yeah. The profile data is like the... It, it, it's it's everyone's nemesis. It's like this thing where we really want to collect. Uh, we really want to know more about our members, and then we put that in this kind of this bucket of profile data, which is uh, tons of different things depending on the organization that you want to know about your members. Um, and and I'm going to show you a way to collect that really really effectively. But if you have updated profile, and a perfect example is titles. Mm. Titles are always changing. You know, so like, do you even have the right title? What about, and there's some organizations that want to know salary range. There's some organizations that, depending on the, where they are in their career, there's different kinds of information. And the way we currently collect it, I say we, I, I talk like I'm an association, but the, so the way we, meaning the association we, co currently collects it is is through membership sign up. but now you're increasing the friction to get somebody to sign up. Um, so we're constantly sending out re requests to update your profile information, which, by the way, requires logging in and then finding the section on the form and filling out a form online. Um, Nancy says profile data is hard to maintain. Plus, uh, we would love to have more demographic data, but having trouble getting those that, that those data from clients. Yes, that's what I'm talking about here. So zero party data is things that you ask your members and they tell you. That's zero party data. And then, of course, there's first and second and third party data. Let's not worry about that right now. But zero party data is what we specialize in. And that is asking questions directly to someone and they tell you. So I'm going to show you a way that we can do that and that, that reduces the friction immensely. And that is just asking a question in an email, capturing their answer, whether it's a click or an open ended field. Right, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how we can do that, and then all that data gets written back to, back to Wicket or whatever your AMS is for that matter. Um, and, and the idea here is you don't want to try to collect everything at once. You collect things over time. You get to know them over time, just like humans get to know each other over time. I said earlier that I, I want to have this conversation about how we make data more human. Well, when you meet somebody, unless you're me. But when most people meet someone, 
they don't interrogate them. They don't go through like this laundry list of things. You get to know somebody over time by asking a lot of questions and conversation over time. And that's what we want to encourage by asking questions every now and then. And PropFuel does not replace your email marketing system. There's a time to tell people things, but there's also a time to listen. And that's what we're all about. We're about the listening. So that's, we're gonna, I really, in the examples piece of this, with the last section, I can't wait to show you some of these examples, especially the one where you can capture profile data with immense success. It's awesome. Hey, Dave, it reminds me of a story. Like most people on this call probably know Reggie Henry. So Reggie's the Chief Information and Engagement Officer at ASAE. He is just an absolute gem in the association community. Loves talking technology, pushing technology forward. And we're working, both Dave and I work really closely with Reggie and his team at ASAE. And he tells this story of, you know, regularly, I've heard him tell this story many times of sitting down across the table from one of his existing members in association and saying, tell me what you need from us. What do you need from ASA as your association? And the person responded saying, well, Reggie, you should already know. Because you ask me in so many different ways across all these different tools. If I'm going to an event, um, if when I'm signing up for my membership, all these different ways you're asking me, you, you should already know, right? And so this is the problem a lot of associations have is they ask in different ways at different times, but it doesn't come back to a central place where you can really then use that data and really deliver a better member experience. So I think it's where everybody's kind of driving towards is, you know, yes, collecting the information, but making sure, like Dave was saying, that it does come back to a central place that then it can be used by other systems so that your member actually does feel like you know them uh, because you should. Uh, there's a question here specifically for you, and then we're going to get back into this. We're going to continue this conversation by going to topic three. And then topic four is just the examples of everything we've been talking about. So topic three is a continuation of this discussion about personalization. And then topic four is examples. And then we're going to wrap it up with uh, some giveaway stuff. Um, but in the meantime, Diane would like to know our current system is both an AMS and an LMS. Can Wicked do that as well? I want to answer that for you, but I think you should probably. <laughs> I can answer that. that. I can answer yeah. yeah, it might be fun. You want me to? Yeah, do it, please. All right. Wicket is like this core central, and you're gonna. I want you to fine tune this afterward. But it's like this core member member um, data. Uh, what's the word, Jeff? Platform member data platform. So it's this core member data platform. What's beautiful about that is you can tie in all these best of breed systems to do the jobs they do best. And I'll tell you what I've seen AMSs that have email systems, and they suck. They're awful, right? So everybody buys like Real Magnet or Informs or or Mailchimp or HubSpot, and they integrate that into their AMS. But some AMSs aren't very good at integrating things, or they're old schools so that requires like a lot of extra fees. So the beauty behind Wicket is that it's really good at what it does, which is member data management, and then you tie in best of breed tools into Wicket. Jeff, what did I mess up? That's pretty good, Dave. That's pretty good, except for trying to get that word platform. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. So basically, you know, Wicked is often seen as an alternative to an AMS system and, you know, but we're not an AMS. We replace what an AMS can do by bringing together um, best of need, which Mike just said, love that term too, Mike. Um, and awesome to see Mike here. Um, and um you know, really connecting those tools together. So having a better web platform, having a better e-commerce platform. And we would never say, well, here's the wicked LMS. We'd say, what's the best LMS for you? And let's integrate with that system and provide, you know, a really great experience. So, uh, so having, having owned an LMS company and built it from scratch from 2001, right? So this is early, early days. Uh, I'm, I, it's a little arrogant to say, but I do believe I'm one of the pioneers of online learning. And and I, I did that with all of you in in hearing what we sucked at and then learning to do it better. And um uh oh thanks, bye Mike. So so the um so but the idea of an LMS is it varies dramatically depending on your needs. You have mandatory credits, you need quizzing, is it you're more interested in the videos, is are you giving away content? So anyway, there's we're beating this up, Jeff. Right. <laughs> Let's go back to talking about personalization. And I got into this a little bit. I think we can breeze through this one pretty quickly. But the idea of turning data into a personalized action that resonates your with your members, that's the goal here. So remember the problem is these 
broadcast. We're talking at people and we're not listening. We don't necessarily know their needs at the individual level. Remember, individual level, not the segments, and certainly not the aggregate. What is our membership need? You do need to know that, by the way. So there's still time for surveys. There's still a time for broadcast messaging, but there is a time also to listen to your members at the individual level at scale. Sure, you can pick up the phone if you want with 3,000 members or 10,000 members or 100,000 members. Um, I think there's services that do that for you if you want. Um, it sounds awful to me. Um, and, and, and you could go meet them at a conference. But, you know, it's not scalable to do that stuff. And that's what a software platform is designed to do that's centered around asking questions. Now, the beauty of asking questions using software is that imagine taking a survey tool and a marketing automation system and they get married and then they have a baby. I don't know what my hand symbols are doing, actually. I was wondering about that too, Dave. I was like, what does this mean? The baby would be <laughs> propule. And so the idea of asking questions that triggers activities, and if it's and we've got you know close to 50 uh, integrations, what we call connectors with other AMSs, but the idea is that based on a certain trigger, somebody gets a question, the question then based on how they answer it, fires off like 15 different actions. It might be writing something back, alerting somebody. And so now we're starting to talk about personalizing the experience based on how somebody answers the question. What is the path that you want somebody to go down based on how they answer a question? Sure, it's a landing page. Maybe it's a different question to capture a little more information. So that's the idea behind, behind personalization. Wouldn't it be nice if we could personalize well beyond the concept of tokens? And if you don't know what I mean when I say tokens, I mean like first name, title, organization. Like, wouldn't it be nice if instead of putting tokens into an email to personalize that, what if we could actually get to the heart of what somebody really needs and wants and give that to them immediately? Well, that's what the automation does after asking questions. All right, Jeff, anything to add about the personalization before we jump into some examples? Yeah, I think, I, I think that, you know, it's it's really interesting, Dave. Like you're, you know, when you talk about uh, prop fuel and the way, like I and I love you guys call it conversational engagement. I just love that term. It's we always debate whether that makes sense or not. Tell, hey, in the chat, tell me if, if what I'm saying to you does conversational engagement resonate with you, or you're like, what what the hell is that? So anyway, go on, Jeff. Uh, see, Margaret likes it. Um, but I think, you know, I just love this concept of listening. You know, and that's really what you're doing, you know, with your platform, Dave, you're asking questions and you're listening to the member and then driving automations off of that to, to keep that engagement going and keep listening and starts to create a bit of a flywheel effect of learning more and asking more. And so, and I, and I really like that. And I think, you know, in our platform, one of the ways we also, you know, think about listening is through a concept we have called touch points in our product and touch points are, Think of them as like, what are the key actions happening as somebody engages with, you know, as a member engages with your organization, they registered for an event, they replied in your online community, they uh, completed a course in your LMS, they logged into your website. Like those are what we'd call touch points that come in to Wicked. And it's more behavioral data. Um, so it's more first party data, but there's a lot of power when you can combine first party data with zero party data. I know those terms are kind of like, you know, zero party, first party, it's kind of odd. Um, but it's really combining. When we were prepping for this, we're like, wait, is second party data a thing? Yeah, like we actually had to Google it and it is. Yeah, yeah. Second In fact, party data is, is, is when you use somebody else's first party data. <laughs> so. Like this, for example, when J Wicket sent out registrations for this webinar, we send out registrations. And of course, we'll share them with each other. Uh, you're going to get a follow up email from us. I mean, that, that's why we do this. And, and so the names that signed up through a prop fuel, Jeff will get, and that's second party data. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it's, so it's really interesting, but I think just that idea of, you know, listening and then being able to leverage technology from that listening is just really cool. And I like the blending of, you know, the profile data and that core information with the more 
behavioral data. Um, and then being able to automate actions based off of that's really cool. I'm going to show a bit of a, a visualization when we get to some examples that helps show a little bit about um, about how those how systems can work together and do that kind of listening. So, Dave, you want to jump into some examples? Is that what is that what we want to do here? I'm busy flirting with uh, clients. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, so um, I think what what I'd like to do, if I could, uh, is share with you three examples. And this is one slide. We're not going to go through a whole like demo sort of thing. But I want to. We've been doing a lot of talking, and I want to show you what this looks like. So here's here's one that we did with Missouri State Teachers Association. So inside this purple square, now that I'm hovering over, this is kind of what an email might look like centered around profile data it's, and then you know followed by a question at the bottom of this email it says is this correct it's just one of many many examples of any question you could ask and you can see we did put these tokens in there saying hey this is what we have for you it's like uh in this case they're giving away a gift card that's pretty unusual oftentimes it's just collecting one or two things and and then we ask them to respond but um they got an outrageously high response, 25% response to this. They got all their uh, the correct alternate email addresses, sent that back to the AMS. They, they got updated job titles. And here was something really cool. One of the follow-up questions to this was, um, I, by the way, we have a, a, a mail publication we send through the mail. Um, do you want that or would you prefer digital? And they saved 23K over the course of two emails uh, because they got 2,700 people say, yeah, I don't need the, I don't need more stuff in my, in my mailbox. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, like if they say, is this information correct? And they say something as simple as no, it brings them to another page. Not, they don't have to log into any AMS, but brings them to another page which says, well, which information would you like to update? And then right there's an open-ended open box and they type in their updated um, address or, per, or, or alternate email or whatever. And as soon as they hit submit, it gets written back to the database. It's awesome. All right, the next, and unbelievable uh, engagement like that. And you do this over time too. You're doing this over a long period of time. Now, ASAE, they've been working with us for a long time, but they have a new and renewing member campaign. Now, normally you think about new member campaigns, and I like that because you can get very, very targeted. But with a new and renewing member campaign, you can bring all of your existing members through it too. And it, the only difference is the kinds of questions you're going to ask are going to be slightly different. But one of their first questions that Amy used to send out, she's now with uh, uh, ASAM, um, uh, but uh, Jen uh, Noveski is the membership director over there. Uh, VP of membership. So she, the, it comes from her now, but this email goes out and it says, hey, we're so glad you're a member of ASAE. What's most important to you this year in your career? And like, here's an example of something cool. If somebody clicks on, I want to get or prepare for my CAE, they get dropped into another campaign that gets put in on, on ice for three months. And so it waits for three months and three months later, it's going to send this person and I'll say, hey, a couple months ago, you told us, or actually, there'd be a few, a few months ago, you told us that that you were getting, uh, preparing for your CAE this year. How's that going? And then the options might be something like, uh, did it, score, which is going to lead to like some success or thing. Although ASA should probably know that in their database, whether, so this is not a perfect example, but then uh, there may be one where they, they'd say, well, uh, I've started but it's slow going and maybe we bring them to a page that says uh here's here's some of the study groups you can get involved in or here's ways you can improve the process and here's some tips or it might be like i'm taking my test or i'm ready for my test i've gotten all my hours i think it's like 100 hours or something i've gotten all my hours uh, of learning and i'm ready for the test maybe brings the book the test right there and then so, so there's all these cool things. Another one they do is around volunteering. This is like month six. You know, they've been a member for six months. We're renewed now for six months. Say, hey, you're interested in volunteering? They got like 1,800 people in the first year of going through the cycle to say, yeah, I want to volunteer. Like so many, they didn't even know how to place all these volunteers. So we had to help them with like building a process around that. All right, and the final example I wanna show, and by the way, please jump in and ask questions. I see the chat. Um, I love this example. 
traditionally, and I'm not showing you the email that goes up with the results. Traditionally, when it comes time to renewal, you send somebody a note maybe 90 days before, 60 days out, 30 days out, a week before, the day before, the day after, and then through the grace period and then through lapsed, right? So you, you, you have these, this period of time where you're chasing down the money, trying to get the money, trying to get the money. Now you send them an email and you send dozens of emails and you send them an email and it, that you, you say, hey, this is why we're awesome and why you should renew. We got so many things. There might be a bunch of links in there to the all the value proposition things that you offer. And then at the bottom or maybe even at the top, it has a button that says renew now. Now, one of a handful of things happens. They renew now. Sweet. It worked. And that does happen. Or nothing. In which case, like, what happened? Did they get the email? Did they see it? Um, you have no information. Maybe you know if they opened it, but you don't even really know that because a lot of email systems say it's opened or if they opted out of privacy or opted into privacy, it's going to say it's opened. Uh, or maybe they clicked on it and then they saw they had to log in and they didn't have their password and they're like, oh, I'm not going to do that. Or maybe they clicked on it and just didn't really feel like going through that long renewal form because they had to break out their credit card and pay, right? So you got all these points of friction and lacking information. So what we encourage our clients to do, by the way, we did, we one, one little anecdote before we got... Entrepreneurship is a series of, as, as anything, you learn things over time. So our first question, before we really got into these questions, the first question we encouraged our clients to ask was, uh, did you know your membership lapsed? And Jeff, you may know the answer to this, but I'm going to quiz you anyway. What do you, in fact, I'd love to see in the chat, I want to see what people think, um, and this is for lapsed members, did you know your membership lapsed? What percentage of people would say no after like a dozen emails, they went through the whole renewal process. What percentage of members across the board of people do you think said, no, I didn't know my membership lapsed. So Jeff, let's wait for a few of these to come. Holy mackerel, 80. The numbers coming in. I was gonna say really high too, um, like 70, 75%. Um, what's really funny, Dave, is like, I am an example of this working because my ASAE member lapsed and I'm sure they had sent me a whole bunch of emails about it, but for whatever reason, they were going to my spam or whatever. And I just never saw them and it was just out of sight, out of mind. And I got one of your, the emails from your system saying, hey, Jeff, did you realize you, you remember? And I was like, no. And I went and renewed it. Actually, uh, I did. Me too. That same thing happened yeah. to me. And it was funny getting an email from my platform yeah. engaging me. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's funny to say some, I, I some, people in the comments, some people in the comments have said, hey, I've never gotten any of these targeted emails from ASAE. Um, so could be going to spam, could be, you know. Something's up there. Um... So the uh, this is fascinating, just how dark and jaded you all are. Um, I can't believe you are all saying like 80, 90 percent of people didn't even know their membership lapsed. Like, good grief. No, no. The average was like 53 percent. And I thought that was high. In fact, we have one client who I do not want to name that it was like 82 percent. I thought that was outrageous. 82 percent of people that let their membership lapse didn't know their membership had lapsed think about the opportunity if 80 some odd percent of your members didn't know their membership lapsed think about the opportunity to get them to renew if all you have to do is alert them in a way that is effective in in, in the way that you communicate so now we go out to people and say hey are you planning to renew we don't care i don't care if they knew their membership lapsed i just want to know are you planning to renew yes or no. And sometimes you can throw in a third option, like I'm not sure, but you get outrageous number of people to say yes, no, because it's frictionless. It's really easy. And then they say no. Yes. Well, why not, dude? Like what's going on? Why wouldn't you want to renew? And oftentimes, very, very often it's I'm retiring. And a lot of associations offer a retirement program that gets missed. So you're losing people because they didn't know their membership lapsed and you're losing people because they're going off into retirement and didn't know you offer something. So Jeff, those are the examples I have. I'm going to scan all these comments, but do you want to get into some of your, your examples? 
Yeah, I was just going to walk through one example because I think it maybe helps to kind of illustrate the example of how how systems can work together and, and how a data exchange can work. So while you're jumping into the, the comment feed like I was just doing, I'll share my screen and I'll just talk through a bit of a, a bit of an example. So uh, this is a tool called Miro that is one of my favorite tools for you know online visual collaboration. It's like a, a whiteboarding tool. Uh, so Miro.com. Um, it's it's a lot of fun and we use it every single day here at Wicket. I wonder, I put together a bit of an illustration just to show, and I'll make it a little bit bigger here, zoom in a little bit more. Yes, right, there we go. Um, and so the idea here is that, so here we have Wicket, a member data platform holding zero party data. So profile data, relationships between people and organizations, their job title, where they work, all this rich information. Are they a member or not? all kinds of things. And so what we can do then through, you know, through our API and connecting with other systems is share that zero party data. So if I use Dave's platform as an example, PropFuel, we can share that zero party data over to them, their name, their title, their email. Are they an active member or not? What type of member? Uh, what interests do they have? Uh, what how have we tagged them in our system with different taxonomy or tags? And something as obscure maybe as what if they're a student, when was their graduation? So just to get to get the other system the information it needs so it can now go do its job. And Dave's tool is built to send out email or text SMS questions to members. So it can now send out an email saying, hey, um, like the example Dave was bringing, like, you know, why did you join our association? Like, just ask a simple question. Really what we're asking for, what are your interests? What are your interests area? So the person's gonna respond. And that response, ideally they're gonna respond. And when they respond, Dave's platform knows about that, but we can also write that data back into the member data platform, the hub. So now we know something more about this person. Not only do we know that piece of zero party data, the, you know, what their interests are or what they're most interested in, we also have a piece of behavioral data that they took part in this survey, right? So we have a couple new pieces of data in our platform that we can use. Well, what that starts to do is it creates a bit of a flywheel, right? And so now what we can do is say, well, what other systems might be interested in that type of data? So we can automatically be sharing that with, let's say, the association's website. Now we know, we, the association knows what types of interests this person has. So how about next time they log into our website, we have it set up that if their interests are mainly networking, that the first thing they're gonna see when they log in is our upcoming events. And we're gonna promote that and we're gonna create that more personalized experience to them. And now they engage and maybe they go register for an event. And maybe we've collected a bit more information from them now when they went through that event registration and the behavior that they've registered for one of our events. And that data all comes back into the hub, into that source of data. So you can picture how that starts to flywheel, right? Now maybe we've learned something new that we're sharing with prop fuel and saying, hey, we know this new thing and that's going to trigger a new question. Or the next time they go to our event platform, we've shared some of that data with it and it can now tailor its experience. The online community maybe is now promoting specific topics because we've learned some things about the person. Now, the key, of course, is keeping that data up to date and trying to stay engaged. But like my example with Reggie that I talked about earlier, we're ask, we're typically asking information from our members in a lot of different places. And I think what's super important is to, you know, present the information to them that we already know and not have them keep filling it in over and over because that's just a poor member experience. So let's make sure you have that data there and that they're just confirming it. And when they do confirm it or update it, make sure it gets back to that core system of record. Because if it doesn't get all the way back there, odds are you're now starting this disconnected experience and you're not going to be able to have, you know, those proper, those proper conversations. So just want to walk through a bit of a flow there to show how, you know, data can move around and how you can leverage your data. But so much of it's important to coming back to that, to that central hub, whatever it is at your organization, your AMS, your CRM, uh, your, your MDP. All right, Jeff, listen, I'd suggest maybe we skip the key takeaways for us. Originally, we had proposed a, you and I would maybe come in our key takeaways. I'd rather actually hear everybody else's key yeah, takeaways. I think. So yeah, like, maybe you could, based on what you heard today, put in your key takeaways into the chat. In the meantime, I'd like to tell you about this little, originally we had thought, let's raffle some stuff off. So I got... Uh, these cool 
we give these out to all our clients. So if you're a client, I know we have some on here. You probably already have these. If you don't, send me an email and I'll get them out to you right away. We got these cool hats. You know, they're the legacy, like old trucker hats. Pretty, pretty cool hats. Rave okay. reviews. We got these cool t-shirts. Uh, uh, super comfy, soft. And then, you know, we got some other silly stuff like stickers and stuff. So I want to send a package. Oh, and I'll send you a, a choose your own adventure book. Uh, the, oh, the hat is the best. Thanks, Margaret. So like, if if you want this, it's just fun. That's all we're doing here. We're just having fun, maybe a little bit of a bribe. So instead of doing a raffle, because we couldn't really figure out how to do that in a webinar live, here's what we want to do. Um, it, it is a bit of a bribe. We obviously want to continue the conversation with you. If you're not working with us, we want to work with you. We do. And, and I know I can speak on behalf of PropFuel. I know we can help improve the way you're communicating with your members. So if you're interested, I'm putting in a link for both of ours. It looks like, uh, Jeff, we got yours in there. Good. Mine is in there as well. Uh, the PropFuel. Yep. If you want to continue the conversation, we know who you are. We're going to send you some swag. Jeff, what do you have for swag? Yeah, okay. So I'm, as a Canadian, you know, my Canadian friends will appreciate that this is a toque. But for our American friends, this is a beanie. Um, we can go pom-pom or no pom-pom. Um, so, yeah, we can totally do this. Rock it. I'd be rocking it already, but it is a little warm. So uh, it doesn't make sense. But I got, we got all kinds of stuff too. We got hoodies with the logo on them, t-shirts, stickers, pens, all that stuff. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll ship some stuff out. I, not to call you out, but I, Catherine, Prop Fuel, not Propel. Propel is actually another company owned by Jamie and Maddie uh, Grant. Um, I am. Uh, so don't, don't confuse those two. <clears throat> um, Autocorrect. Uh, yeah, Jeff, I like the beanie, man. Those are nice. You, you uh, must have one, don't you? I don't. I don't, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna book a demo if I have I'll to. Bring some, I'll bring some to Atlanta, and I'll give you. One. You can wear it in Atlanta. Stay cool. <laughs> I don't think that's gonna happen. So, with that, uh, did we get any people telling us what their key takeaways were? I, I don't see any, so that's all right. You guys don't want to play our game. That's fine with me. <laughs> um, with that. Jeff, do you have anything you want to wrap up with? You need to focus on the human. There we go. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Yeah, for sure. No, it's and that's that's really what it's all about, uh, Margaret. For sure. Like I think for me, it's it's just that you know for us, it's about you know the importance of embracing an ecosystem of software tools, but having that ecosystem connected to a data hub so that then you can get towards this idea of a more personalized member experience and create that flywheel of learning, listening, learning, and reactivating and continuing continuing that journey. <laughs> I work for a 20th century organization. Oh, no deal. <laughs> That's fair. I get that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I agree, Jeff, and I, I think there's... Uh, uh, this is kind of the last comment I'll make. There's a trade-off for everything and it's, it's a balance, right? Like naturally, instead of doing a webinar, I would much prefer come have lunch with every single one of you, take you out and have a nice conversation. Um, that doesn't work. Maybe get on the phone or Zoom like that. That would be cool. It's just not realistic. And I'd love to, I'd love for you guys to talk to every single one of your members. Some of you can do that. Um, but it's unusual. And even if you can, you're not going to talk to them every few weeks or every month. So it's a trade-off as to um, what level of personalization you have versus the level of, of human uh, contact, right? Like, obviously, if you use Propule, it's not as good, or Wicked, it's not as good as being there face-to-face -face in person with somebody from a human level. Sometimes it's better though, and in a lot of ways. So there's a trade-off. Silos are not healthy, true debt. All right, Jeff, thank you very much. Thank you all for yeah, joining. Thanks right. everybody for coming. I can't, I can't wait to send out a handful of these uh, swag boxes to you guys. So I hope some of you signed up. And if, again, if you're a client and you don't have one, book it. Yeah, right. exactly. I don't know what that means, book it. Send me a note is what I meant by that. <laughs> book it. <laughs> So, Jeff, this will be fun. Let's see if we can put this on uh, in the podcast, too. Yeah, for sure. That'd be fun. And uh, right. yeah, we'll, have to, we'll have to do it again as well, because 
we could talk for hours. Thank you all. Have a great day. Yeah, thanks, everybody.